a famous mathematician's father once said to her reserve your right to think for even to think wrongly is better than not to think at all this quote is taken from line hard 1974 the person that was told this was hypatia and the following slides you will learn about the mathematics of hypatia and her contributions to the world this map displays where hypatia was born and this was also the same place in which she died this place was alexandria egypt she was born there in 370 a.d greenwald and immense said that there is no evidence that she traveled outside of alexandria this section will contain basic information about hypatia's life and later we will go over more deeply about her contributions to the mathematics world Deacon 1994 described Hypatia as a philosopher, a teacher of philosophy, a mathematician, an astronomer, a learned woman, and a geometer. This sentence um, is a good overall uh, summary of what Hypatia was and what she did for the world in her lifespan. So the beginning of her life. Her father was Theon. He was a famous mathematician and a library's director. He Whenever he had Hypatia, he wanted to raise a perfect human being, and it is unknown who Hypatia's mother was. We believe that Hypatia was never married, but she did have multiple men in her life. Her father worked at the University of Alexandria, and this is how Hypatia got her into this university. She would later work here, give lectures here, and also attend school here. Hypatia lived a very valuable and um, lucky life because she was nurtured by the best minds in the land, um, from famous philosophers to famous mathematicians, and so she became the fourth, fourth century mathematician and was considered the first woman mathematician. She also worked with astronomy, medicine, and philosophy, so not only was she a famous mathematician, she was also helpful in helping these other categories. In the following slides and previous slides, we believe most of this information about Hypatia to be true by historians, but the writings of Hypatia have all been lost, so what we know of her thoughts come from citations and quotations from the works of others. And also some of the slides, the information from the slides, are fictional or only true to our knowledge, so basically What's being presented may or may not be true, but we believe it to be true from historians and different um, citations that we've found. Hypatia lived during a time where there was a struggle for power in Egypt, and because she was a philosopher and also well known, her and her beliefs were different and would eventually put her in the center of the struggle for a political mastery of Alexandria. So not only was she famous for mathematics. She also um, was put in a tough spot because she was preaching different beliefs than what was normally accepted in Egypt at the time. So as mentioned before, Hypatia was a philosopher. Hypatia practiced Neoplatonism. This was a progressive philosophy. Um, a few of the main points that they believed in was that life is an unfoldment, and the further we travel, the more truth we can comprehend. Now, these are only two of the main points, and they believe in much more, but that is not the main focus of this presentation. It's more what Hypatia did for mathematics, so there's just a brief um, understanding of what she believed. In addition to this, she was an unquestioned leader of the Neoplatonic Platonic school of philosophy and took part in the last attempt to oppose the Christian religion. So during this time in Egypt, um, the Christian religion was obviously the prominent religion and Hypatia was attempting to oppose it, which did not go over well with most people and would lead to her tragedy eventually. Um, Orestes was also a ha associate of Hypatia and he was Christian and the Roman political leader of Alexandria. And even though she was um, close with him and an associate, she, they were associates, he was never able to get Hypatia to convert to Christianity. 
Um, Hypatia also surpassed all of her other philosophers of her time in her knowledge and things that she did. So the death of Hypatia is probably the thing most people know about Hypatia's life, if they know anything. Um, her death was extremely brutal and came down to the fact that she was trying to oppose Christianity. She died in 14, 415 AD at 45 years old, and the series of events describe how she died. So she was basically on her way home from her classes when a mob of religious zealots um, took her and they cut her and hit her with sharp oyster shells, tore her apart by limbs, and then lit rema her remains on fire. So, as said earlier, this is an extremely brutal death. Um, it wasn't just a death from old age. She died at 45 years old because people did not like what she was doing in opposing her, the Christianity, which was the main beliefs of Egypt. So, this marked the end of long and glorious history of Greek mathematics. And it's also believed that um, Hypatia's death symbolized the generations of European freethinkers, scientists, and anti-Catholics because she was one of the last people to try and oppose the, um, those people. So her death kind of ended that generation. So as I was going through those slides, I'm sure you kind of built your own um, picture of what Hypatia looked like and it was probably mental like if someone were to ask you right now you probably could describe what you were thinking of. So this is something that Greenwald and Mentz suggested doing with your class so if you're going to go into anything about Hypatia maybe give them a brief background and then ask them hey what do you think Hypatia looks like based on the information I've given you thus far? I haven't described her looks at all, but you know she is a female during the 370 AD to 415 AD. And um, so in the next slide, I will show a picture, um, but it's actually a sketch of her because there is no evidence of what Hypatia looked like. Now, historians have drawn many sketches of what they believe her to look like, but there's no like, pictures or any tracings of exactly what she looks like. So this next slide will display what it's believed she looks like, and you can judge how um, correct you were with historians and with your beliefs. So the, here's a picture of Hypatia of Alexandria, what we believe to be she looked like. As you can see, she was a female and um okay this following section will explain what Hypatia did for mathematics world but not prove anything I will go into depth of one of the topics in a later section to prove it mathematically so she is not known for her discoveries rather she made commentaries on other scholars' work. So a commentary, its goal is to help preserve ideas from ancient times. So she's basically taking other people's works and editing them or rewriting them because, you know, as things get old, it gets harder to read them or they're less clear. So she's kind of editing them. And then um, she made them to prove provide copies of ancient texts and assistance for students who only had the text and not a teacher to learn from. So I think this is interesting because we have textbooks to kind of supplement our classrooms in today's society and not um, use them full on, but she was writing these in an attempt to help students who did not have a teacher and only had the text. So another intention she had of her commentaries were to help her own students better understand difficult topics. So as stated previously, she did work as a professor and teacher at the University of Alexandria. And so during that time, she was making these commentaries, and she did that in order to help her students understand difficult topics 
even if they did come to our lecture, they might still be struggling in these commentaries for a way for them to read them and understand them better. So eventually her commentaries became so developed that people would come to the University of Alexandria from far places to hear her lectures. We believe that she lectured on topics like Diophantus's Arithmetica and his techniques, his solutions, and the symbolism of this writing. And then also we believe she lectured on Plato's and Aristotle's ideas. So, without Hypatia's commentaries on Diophantus, we would have much less of his works, because we know that he was be even before Hypatia, and we have so little on Hypatia that without her works and commentaries on Diophantus, then we may not have anything of him. She edited works on geometry, algebra, and also astronomy. And then Cynesis of Siren was a student of Hypatia, and the student credits Hypatia with creating the astrolab, the plane sphere, and these were devices that helped study astronomy. And then we also believe she created devices to distill water, to measure the level of water, and to determine the specific gravity of liquids. So this is really cool. This isn't really a part of mathematics, but it is science-y. And we know that science and mathematics are related, so I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, but actually, few of these devices that she created remains. But this makes perfect sense because also few of her works remain, so it makes sense that also the instruments don't remain either. So basically a commentary can be compared to a new book edition so you have to buy textbooks and it usually says like third edition fourth edition and then the author of a commentary so Hypatia is essentially an editor so those people are taking older works and maybe translating them to a new language or making them simpler to understand based on um, more modern findings about how to solve problems so we're only going to go into three of the four commentaries because one of the commentaries is um, about astronomy and it's about Ptolemy's Algam Almageist and that's more science based so we'll just go into her three um, commentaries about mathematics topics. So our first dealt with Archimedes' dimension of the circle and this um, had Greek and Arabic copies, and the Arabic version was more clear, um, careful explanation and was more had more clarification than the Greek one, so they believe that a, it had to be written by a master teacher, which is why historians think that Hypatia had to have helped write the commentary on Archimedes' dimension of the circle. And basically, this um, created a good estimate of the ratio of circumference to diameter, which is what we now know as pi. Diophantus's Arithmetica is um, an algebra topic, and it introduced symbols. It contained problems with many solutions and in indeterminate analysis. And the Hypatia's commentary on this work just shows how versatile she was and how um, great of a mind she really had. And then the third one, Apollonius's Conics. This is the section we'll be diving deeper into and proving more in a later slide. Um, but this works use parabola, ellipse, and hyperbola, all named by Apollonius. And we will, um, like I said, explore this more in following slides. Okay, so classroom applications. Um, most of us in this class are going to be high school or middle school mathematics teachers. So really while we're doing this research, we want to be thinking about how can we apply what we're learning into our future classroom. And that's what I will um, show you in the following slides. The following activities were all suggested in an article by Greenwald and Mintz. Um, so the first one they suggest is to go through um, one of Diophantus's algebraic equations that is contained within one of Hypatia's commentaries on his works. 
So basically what you would want to have your students do is take one equation and give it to them and see if they can work to translate the problem into modern notation. And then once they have it in modern notation, you would want them to try and solve the problem. And then you would have different presentations to the class to see about if everybody did it the same way, if there were different ways to do it. This is similar to what we've done in some of our discussion boards in this class. So when we had to like take one of the equations and translate it into modern notation or relate it to what we do today to see how it affected what we do today. So the second activity suggested by Greenwald and Mentz was to use GeoGebra with your class to have them analyze the ratio of circumference to diameter. Um, by doing this, they would be looking into the commentary done on Archimedes' dimension of the circles, and um, this gets them to think about what pi actually represents rather than just thinking, we know pi represents approximately 3.14, and that's why we're going to use it. They would actually know the definition of pi and why it works and why, um, how it was discovered. In addition, using GeoGebra allows them to use technology to keep their answers mathematically precise. This third one I'll actually kind of work through. I won't do it um, entirely the math part, but I'll just show you the different steps. But first, I'm just going to read through the different steps. So, um, they tell you to walk your students through how to prove one of Archimedes' theorems that um, Hypatia would have wrote a commentary on. The theorem states that for any circle, one half the perimeter times the radius is equal to the area. So, um, the following slides will explain the different steps or questions to ask your students to get them to um, prove this theorem, how Archimedes and Hypatia did. So first, you would construct and find the area of a square inscribed in a circle of diameter 6 inches, as shown. And then you would, um, Archimedes knew the Pythagorean theorem and other facts. So as your students were doing them, this, you would want them to state any facts that they use. And then after that, they would bisect the arcs formed by the inscribed square. Then they would obtain four new points, and then you would connect these points in the corners of the square with straight lines to obtain the octagon in the picture. Um, essentially, they would be making an octagon, and then they would want to find the area of the inscribed regular octagon. Um, you would have them give their answer in exact radical notation and also approximate to four decimal places. After that, they would find the area of a square circumscribed about the same circle we started with in question two. And then you would ask your students, what bounds have you now found for pi? So their answers would be like, blank is less than or equal to pi is less than or equal to blank. So like they would have bounds for pi. Um, you would want them to approximate their result to four decimal places, and then ask them to calculate the area of the circle with diameter six inches using 3.1416 as the approximation of pi, and compare that approximation to their approximations. Okay, so before we get into that, I'm going to go through those different steps that I just read so that you can kind of picture what was going on. So, you would want to start with a circle, diameter 6 inches. So, we're just going to draw a rough circle, and then we know the diameter is 6 inches. And then, We know we need a square. So then they would, you would want your students to find the area of the square in there using the Pythagorean theorem, and then they would state their facts that they use to find the area of that. Following that, they would bisect the arcs formed by the inscribed square. So these arcs they're talking about are these. So bisecting them, you would want to cut them in half cut them in half. We're just roughly cutting them in half here. And then you're wanting to connect those points to the points on 
our square, the corners of our square. This isn't the best drawing, I apologize, but essentially those will make you an octagon. Then you will want your students to find the area of that octagon and they would want to approximate that area to four decimal places. And then what they would want to do is make a square outside. Outside, apologize. Outside of the circle. And then they would want to find the area of that. So they would find the area of that. And then essentially they would use the bounds of the octagon and the square outside to approximate their pi value, and then they would use the approximation of 3.1416 to find the area, the actual area, and then they would compare those answers. So I thought that one might be interested, interesting to work through with the classroom, and uh, although it might be a little bit difficult at first, it would allow them to really problem solve about how to uh, use the Pythagorean theorem and other known facts to try and solve the problem. Okay, so moving into this next session, we're going to be looking at how does Hypatia connect to what we did in our History and Math course 44, 4110. So, um, in this course, we went and explored Greek math ideas, um, and it's believed that Hypatia helped preserve some of the treasures of ancient Greek mathematics and astronomy. So basically, without Hypatia and her commentaries that preserved um, what Greek, ma Greek mathematicians found out, we might not have gotten to learn about the Greek math topics that we did in this course. In addition, we explored some ideas of Archimedes in this course, and as stated in the last um, example of how to apply it into a classroom, Hypatia made a commentary on Archimedes, the dimensions of a circle, and um, so without that, we might not have learned as much as we did about Archimedes in this course. One last connection that I saw that wasn't essentially to this course, but rather to um, our other math education courses. In Hypatia's commentary about Diophantus, it, they mentioned that the problems given had multiple different solutions and solution paths. So whenever I put that, I immediately thought of the idea of multiple representations. Um, in all of our math education courses, we are constantly told you need to make sure your problems should have multiple ways to go about solving them. Make sure your students know that. Make sure you know that when you're grading, that there are multiple ways to go about this. And, um, don't just mark around because it's not the way you went about it. And so I thought that was interesting to see because this is like something new that math teachers are pushing for, but um, it was written back in. Hypatia's commentary about Diophantus so long ago. In this last um, section, we'll be looking at conic sections and proving them and a little bit more about them and what Hypatia did with them in her, her commentary. Conic sections are covered while students are in high school, but rarely is Hypatia mentioned during the study of conics. Even though this is true, we should always have Hypatia in mind while studying conics. Conic sections are actually found through different slices of a fixed cone. So you can see in figure 3.5, there is a fixed cone. The original cone is 3.1. You can see the cones here. And then you see they slice it vertically to result in the hyperbola. They slice it kind of diagonally to get an ellipse. Um, a little more diagonally to get a parabola, and straight horizontally to get a circle. I found this pretty interesting because I hadn't really thought about how conic sections were actually formed, and this is how they came about, conic sections. Um, the one conic section is a parabola. Here you can see different ways a parabola's equation could be written. It's either y equals or x equals, but in both cases, only one term is squared, so you'll always have a squared term. In this case, y equals x squared, 
in this case x equals y squared. For a parabola, you can have, um, it can look many different ways. So you can have an up and down facing parabola, so like a frowny face, a smiley face, you can have it opening left or opening right. It just all depends on the c value and whether it is y equals or x equals. The next conic section is a ellipse. As you can see, an ellipse is drawn here. In an ellipse equation, it is always equal to 1. And then you have x minus something squared over a squared plus. So that's a big key, is that it's a plus sign and it's only equal to 1. Next is a hyperbola. A hyperbola, you might think that the hyperbola's equation is very similar to the previous of an ellipse equation, but like mentioned before, an ellipse has a plus sign, whereas a hyperbola would have a subtraction sign. And also there's a difference in the equals to. This one is equal to plus or minus one, whereas an ellipse is equal to only positive one. In these pictures, you can either have a hyperbola with two parabolas that open to the left and to the right, or you can have an up-down opening para hyper hyperbola. Sorry. And then you can see you would have the vertexes and then the center of your hyperbola being C1, C2, and you can find those here. Those are just some brief characteristics of the conic session sections that Hypatia would have looked into while writing her commentary on this topic. The next is a conic section problem that she probably worked with. When looking over this problem, I realized that I've definitely done this in one of my high school math courses, but I hadn't realized it um, had so much to do with Hypatia. So this might be a rather easy problem for most of us, but I will go ahead and walk us through step by step how Hypatia probably would have done it. So first it says, sketch the graph of the conic section, x squared minus 2x minus 3y squared plus 6y equals 10. What type of conic section is this and how can you tell? So first step to telling what type of conic section this is, you would want to manipulate the equation in order to get it into one of the forms that were previously shown in these slides, like this, this, or this. But one of the key things we notice about this equation is that there are two square values. Because of this, we know it cannot be a parabola. So we are left with the options of an ellipse or a hyperbola. Okay, so we'll walk you through how to manipulate the equation to get it into one of our forms. Go ahead and erase this from earlier. Like I said, the equation was x squared minus 2x minus 3y squared plus 6y equals 10. So the first step in the manipulating of this equation is you want to be able to write um, x minus something squared plus or minus y minus something squared equals something. So basically we're going to want to complete the square of the two values, our x's and our y's. So we'll want to complete the square for this, and we'll want to complete the square for this. We'll start with the x's. So to complete the square, we know you would the c would be equal b squared over 4a, letting this be b and this value be a. So we have x minus x squared minus 2x plus something, and then we have minus 3y squared plus 6y plus something equals 10. When we complete the square on both sides, we'll want to add what we add on this side to this side so that we keep our equation balanced. So first we're going to do negative 2 squared over 4 times 1, since our a value is 1 and our b value is 2. So we have 4 over 4, which we know equals 1. For this one, we're going to do b squared over 4a, which equals 6 squared over 4 times negative 3, which equals 36 over negative 12. 36 divided by 12 is 3, but we're dividing by negative, negative 12, so it'll be negative 3. Like I said before, we have to make sure we add both of these values to this side as well. So we'll go ahead and fill in this. We're going to add 1, subtract 3. Okay, so now we're going to factor these so that we have 
x minus something squared and y minus something squared. To do that for this, it will go into x minus 1 squared. For this, we'll want to factor out a negative 3. And then we'll be left with y minus 1 squared equals 10 plus 1 minus 3, which is 8. So then we know we need it equal to 1. So to get the right side equal to 1, we'll want to divide everything by 8. So we have x minus 1 squared divided by 8 minus 3y minus 1 squared divided by 8 equals 1. Keeping that equation in mind, we'll go back and look at what our general formulas for the different conic sections. So we determine that this equation is either going to boil down to being a hyperbola or an ellipse. When looking at the equation that we found, we know that we had a subtraction sign between the x values and the y values. That's something that I pointed out earlier, that the ellipse always is plus, whereas a hyperbola is always a subtraction sign. Therefore, we can conclude that the given equation will be a hyperbola. But what will it look like? We will need to use this figure and their values given to us in order to sketch a rough sketch of what this equation would look like. So we'll go back to our sketch pad and try and determine what this hyperbola will look like. So when we go back here, we know, let me go ahead and erase. So we know we have x minus 1 squared, sorry, minus y, 1 squared, divided by 8, equals 1. Okay, so. We need our C1, C2, E, and A values. So C1, C2, A, and B. So we're given in our general formula from the text that uh, hyperbola is written as x minus C1 squared over A squared minus y minus C2 over b squared equals 1, plus or minus. So we know by using this, we can figure out what our c1 and c2 values are. So x minus c1. So c1 is 1, as well as c2. Then we will need these denominators to determine a squared and b squared. So a squared equals 8, as well as b squared. So to find a, we will need to square those sides. We take the square root of both sides, we will determine what the a and b values are. So we get a equals 2 radical 2, and b equals 2 radical 2. And then to find, really sketch, we know that to find the center of our parabola, it will be equal to c1 comma c2. So we know c2 is 1, as well as c1. So we have c1, 1, that will be our center. And then to find the vertexes, we'll do C, C1 minus A comma C2, and then C1 plus A comma C2. When we do that, we get 1 minus 2 radical 2 comma 1. So somewhere in there. And then we get 1 plus 2 radical 2 comma 1. Somewhere in there. We can roughly sketch what those two will look like, and that's a rough sketch of our hyperbola. When we go into the presentation again, you can see that this is a rough sketch of what that would look like, which is similar to what we got. Here you can see my bibliography and all the sources that I use for my background on Hypatia and the mathematics that she contributed to. Thank you.